Well, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm going to start without the head of school, um, who is obviously on the way detained. My name is Callum Brown. I'm a, a professor in the uh, history subject area. Can I welcome you on behalf of the School of Humanities to the first Humanities lecture on um, this session. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce Professor Tim Whitmarsh, who is the AG Leventus, or is it Leventus? Leventus. Leventus, thank you, corrected. A professor of Greek Culture at the University of Cambridge. Uh, one of uh, the most prestigious classics courses in the country. Um, Tim is also one of the most distinguished classics scholars of his generation, and is especially well known for his work on the Greek li literature of the Roman Imperial period, um, sometimes known, so I have read, as the Second Sophistic. His 2013 book, um, Beyond the Second Sophistic Adventures in Greek Postclassicism, was praised for seeing poetry as more revealing than prose, um, as a valuable approach to politics of the period. Behind that work was the minute analysis of sometimes scraps of text, the same thing which characterizes his most recent book, Battling the Gods, Atheism in the Ancient World, which is a study of atheism in both ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Contravening, contravening all the prevailing rules that atheism was invented by the Enlightenment, Tim shows how, in his own words, atheism was a narrative possibility within Greek and then Roman myth. How through generations of German, I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> Greek, and then Roman philosophers. The gods were battled, shown to be defeatable, then denied, with some individuals paying a price of their lives to maintain the integrity of their positions. He does this through meticulous word by word, and sometimes I sent even letter by letter analysis of quite minimal sources. I'm a historian of the 20th and 21st centuries, and I work in a period of when sources are um, overwhelming. The problem is not a shortage of them, but where do I start? In some cases, Tim only had a few words of a surviving book to discern an atheist position. In one case, he had a book title and only the first 19 words, On the God, God by 5th century Protagoras, perhaps the world's first relativist, and I would tend to fate by suggesting, though he doesn't, perhaps even the world's first postmodernist. Tim is, Tim's is remarkable scholarship. He shows how the atheist, or atheos, first appeared in the 5th century BC, and how the term and its meanings evolved through godforsaken, into godless, and developed the image of excuse my pronunciation, Theomachos, or battler against gods. Um, as a powerful, also masculine figure, something that interests me um, in the 20th century, because the issue of the, the gender of the atheist is one that's still with us. And he points to Diagoras as possibly the first person in history to self-identify in a positive way as an atheist. Tim's work is joining a recent flurry of research on the history of atheism and non-belief across two millennia, right up to the late 20th and early 21st century. This is turning um, the subject of the study of atheism into something much more developed, something more independent of the history of religion, and making the, the categories of analysis also evolve away from traditional religious history. He has shown um, the necessity of atheism, as Shelley put it in his pamphlet of 1811. It is with the greatest possible pleasure that I introduce Tim Whitmarsh to speak on what do Greek gods mean. Tim Whitmarsh. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. Thank you all of you for coming out on a Friday evening in November. Uh, couldn't be a less hospitable time of the week, I suppose, apart from Monday morning, nine o'clock Monday morning. <laughs> but yes, so what did Greek gods mean? That's the question that I'd be asking today. And it's a phrase that was deliberately chosen to perplex, if you like. Um, I, 
pose the faith and the question in this paradoxical way because I want to get at something which I think is distinctive about ancient Greek conceptions of divinity. Now we tend to think that gods don't mean anything, they just are in the world. And that tendency, I think, extends from an assumption that the nature of the gods is self-evident to the users of that religion. Views like this are rooted for modern scholars in, ultimately, in modern academic theories of religion, which have, at least since Emil Durkheim, probably uh, longer ago than that, uh, seen religion primarily as a technology for social formation. Religion, in this way of thinking, is a translation into a different register of society's fundamental needs. It is, in one set, sense, a short step from Durkheimian functionalism, which says that religion exists to mediate between the individual and the society as a whole, to structuralism, another great 20th century set of interpretations of what religion is up to. Structuralism tends to present religion as a kind of language which members of a given culture use to express their ideas about the way of the world. The language may seem forbidding and weird to outsiders, but the users of that language know exactly what they're doing. So it follows, then, that a religion should seem, if we're looking at it from this perspective, should seem self-evident to its users. So the question, what do gods mean, becomes a pointless and even a perverse one. But my argument in this paper is that what do Greek gods mean is actually getting us towards a conception, a way of a part of how Greeks understood the nature of divinity. Now let me begin by sketching out my reasons for this position. Firstly, I should say, I'm not a functionalist. Whilst I accept that religion is social in origin, and that it can often play uh, a role of social integration, uh, it doesn't do so coherently or consistently. Uh, by intellectual preference, I suppose I'm a, a dysfunctionalist. What does this mean are those moments when religious reasoning confronts its contradictions and its opacities, what I'm going to call in this paper the glitches in the system. Now, of course, the glitches are not always brought to the surface. They're not always visible to its users or to external observers. But they are, I would argue, always there. And the reasons for this uh, glitchiness, if you like, of religion have in part been explained by practitioners of the cognitive science of religion. Now, for CSR, cognitive science of religion, uh, the defining feature of religion is the idea of the counterintuitive. Uh, CSR speaks of minimally counterintuitive concepts, or MCIs. And MCI, to quote Jennifer Larson's recent book on uh, Greek religion, is a concept which violates one or more intuitive beliefs. So, for example, a pig that flies, without overloading conceptual or memory uh, capacity. So you know what a pig is, you know what flying is. It's minimally counterintuitive, but it puts those things together in a way that is counterintuitive. So the minimalness of it is important, but also the counterintuitiveness of it as well. Minimal counterintuitiveness, uh, CSR believes, makes concepts memorable, while too many violations render a concept excessively rather than minimally counterintuitive and less easy to remember. Other properties of concept, such as its inferential potential and its epistemic value, apparent falsehood or truth, may be also factors in memorability. I'm less interested in that now. But it's this idea that religious concepts are minimally counterintuitive that's going to be guiding my thinking in this talk. Now, in its very nature, a god must be an MCI, or at least it must be counterintuitive. <coughs> Uh, as supernatural agents, gods are by definition non-natural, which is to say that they violate our intuitive assumptions about the world. Gods can do things that we can't. Gods can act in ways, move in mysterious ways, if you like, precisely because uh, we know what intuitive ways of moving in the world are. As Larson writes elsewhere, counterintuitiveness is a necessary component of divinity, although it's not a sufficient one. The deity must, in addition to have some kind of explanatory Power. She uses the example, the counter example of an invisible tree, for example. Uh, you, uh, an invisible tree is a minimally counterintuitive uh, instance, but it's not necessarily going to do a lot of load bearing for a society. I mean, if we believe that there are invisible trees around everywhere, you can imagine a culture which thought that that gets you to the deep part of you know, our relationship with the cosmos, but it's not intrinsically 
for most cultures, it's not intrinsically low bearing. So the, the MCI has to do some work for that culture as well. We should note also that the divine MCI is minimally counterintuitive. I mentioned this earlier. It's not an affront to absolutely everything that you intuit about the world. It's just giving it a tweak. It's taking you out of the, the natural world. If you like. It's got enough swerve to arrest the reader's attention or the user's attention. So religion certainly deals in more than just counterintuitiveness, but counterintuitiveness is, in its, it is its defining feature, what separates it from normal life. So if a Catholic eats a normal wafer, that's not a religious act. If a Catholic eats a communion wafer, uh, that becomes a religious act, precisely because of the counterintuitive belief about the nature of the Eucharist. That's to say, uh, the, the religious framing of it the Eucharistic framing of it uh, takes an entirely normal physiological process, eating a snack, um, and makes it into something counterintuitive by the priest's blessing that, con that converts it into part of the flesh of a religious leader who died some 2,000 years ago. So counterintuitive, uh, no, no, uh, the, uh, counterintuitive rituals like the Eucharist are not just open to the question, what does it mean? They actively demand it. The structures of social inclusion and exclusion built around rituals are defined by possession of the answer to that question. Do you know what you're doing? Do you know what's going on here? That's one of the ways in which religious society operates its strategies of inclusion and exclusion. You have a counterintuitive act. Those who understand what you're dealing with it are on the inside. Those who are excluded are on the outside. But that's not the full story because these counterintuitive rituals also refuse fully to answer the question. They have to resist disclosing their full meaning, and they must do this to preserve their own mystical status. If it were absolutely self-evident what the Eucharist means uh, to users of it, then it would cease to be mysterious. It would cease to be um, religious. religious. It, would be, it would have given up too much of its meaning. The paradoxical language that typically surrounds uh, MCI is, is designed both to indicate the presence of the supernatural and to tantalise by withholding full meaning. To hold up a communion wafer and say this is the body of Christ is counterintuitive, we might say, in the same way that Cecilia Pazum Peep is. The mystery works not just by erecting an imaginary division between those who get it and those who don't, but also by destabilising that division and causing uncertainty in the minds of insiders as well. There is no one who can fully explain why Marguerite's pipe is not a pipe, or why the wafer is the body of Christ. There may be people who are, have a better explanation than other people, people that understand more according to the rules of inclusion and exclusion, but nobody can fully escape, fully explain what that means. And that's because that's its function. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the nature of the artwork, not to fully give up its meaning. And the same is true of the religious ritual. Uh, there is also a question of authority being generated here, social authority. So because the authority to say this is that or this is not that is the fundamental basis of the power of all poets, rhapsodes, priests, all people who claim the right to speak in non-intuitive ways about the world. Now my aim today is, I should say, not to argue that this is the wrong way of looking at things. Of course not. I'm probably sounding as if uh, I think that any kind of non-propositional language uh, it's all nonsense, but I don't actually think that. Language is a prison house, as Frederick Bray Jameson put it, albeit ironically. And the language that we receive as users of the language um, is a kind of Frankensteinian concoction. It's entirely ideological, and I think it behooves thinking people to resist it. So the counterintuitive is, is in all sorts of ways, you know, a good socially progressive thing. Uh, as the Russian formalist Viktor Shkovsky argued, metaphors, which are a form of counterintuitive language, shake us out of the autom automotive uh, uh, world of the here and now. They defamiliarize us. They help us to see the world anew. So there can be great value in counterintuitive modes of thinking. But it does depend on how you use them. But, you'll be thinking, there's a world of difference between mysterious rituals and mysterious deities. We can accept the question, what does the Eucharist mean? That's a natural part of, natural, it's a, um, a familiar part, if you like, of the way in which we approach religion. But the question, 
what does God mean is a completely different kind of question. Uh, for most modern people, whether they're religious or not, that is a very weird thing to say. What does God mean? God doesn't mean, he just is or is not, depending on your perspective. But I'm going to be arguing that this is actually a fundamental difference between modern Christian and probably modern Abrahamic monotheistic ways of thinking and ancient Greek ways of thinking. For the Greeks, the question of what gods mean is fundamental and primary, really important, gets us into the heart of Greek conceptions of the divine. Now let's begin with a passage from the second century CE novelist Achilles Tatius. Uh, and it's a passage that I've chosen really for its um, unremarkableness in terms of Greek thought. Uh, it's about, uh, Achilles Tatius' novel is about a a young man who falls in love with a girl, and he's the narrator, my friend, uh, the, the uh, protagonist, is the narrator of the novel. And at one point, he has a symposium, a drinking party, and the combined effect of his desire for Euclid and the drink uh, cause him to become more bold in his approach towards her. So the passage goes, Once Eros and Dionysus, two forceful gods, have gripped the soul, they drive it to ecstatic shamelessness. Now, at the semantic level, for people who know even a little bit of Greek, and probably for most people in this room, this sentence poses very few problems indeed. Eros and Dionysus are referred to as gods, two forceful gods, but we're not actually talking about gods here. We're talking about lust, Eros is lust, and Dionysus is inebriation. The names of the gods have been substituted for things or properties with which they are connected. Eros is perhaps slightly the more interesting case because the god and the concept share a name. We, in modern English, we use capitalization, we are, um, uh, capitalization to mark this distinction. So if we give a capital E, then we say, oh, Eros is the god. If we have the lowercase e, then Eros is sexual desire. But uh, ancient Greek didn't have upper and lowercase orthography. Anyway, this is a very familiar aspect of Greek thought, which can be paralleled from any number of sources, as I say. The Greeks called this linguistic phenomenon, whereby you substitute the god for a concept, metonymy, which literally means changing names. And they treated it as a rhetorical or stylistic uh, device. So here, for example, is a discussion from a little red text, I have to say, Trypo the second. Metonymy is part of a sentence that literally belongs under one heading. So by part of a sentence, he means um, a word or a phrase that literally belongs under one heading, but signifies something else thanks to its family relationship, thanks to a kind of kinship, okay, such as they held the entrails over Hephaestus. What this means is that this signifies over the fire, which is a, in a family relationship with Hephaestus. It's a rather strange translation that I could do here, but you can see what's going on here. Hephaestus is the god of fire, so if you hold some empty entrails over Hephaestus, what you do is you're holding it over the fire. So, um, and goes on, and again, there are length in mighty Ares to say it's fury. Instead of the weapon, you can use Ares, the god of war, to substitute for the weapon. And when we call wine, Dionysus, and bread, Demeter, and such like. So, to go back to our um, uh, passage from Achilles Tatius, Dionysus means wine. Okay, so what does Dionysus mean? I was asking the, the question at the beginning, what do we gods mean? In this case, we can say quite quickly, Dionysus means wine. Because the concept uh, has a kind of kinship, as Trypho would put it in the definition we've just seen, a kind of family relationship with the god, because Dionysus is the god of wine. That's how metonymy uh, operates. If you want a modern snazzy definition of metonymy, it is a transference of meaning within a semantic field, a shared semantic field. Okay, so the semantic field things to do with wine, what you've done is you simply move laterally within that semantic field from wine itself to Dionysus the god of wine. So at some level, it is simply a fancy substitution, as I say, a trick of rhetoric or style, to speak in these uh, terms. And indeed, in Greek, it does come across as a rather elevated, pompous, pretentious way of speaking. But, and this is my point really, it is also more than this, it's not just stylistic or rhetorical. 
is quite evidently a theological claim at one level about Dionysus' presidency in the world of wine. In fact, it's just an interesting feature that the word metonymy is quite familiar to uh, anyone who works in literary studies these days, uh, but in Greek, it's only ever used in connection with uh, gods, as far as I know. This is, this is um, uh, passive resort there. Uh, whenever people say, well, uh, what is metonymy, someone will say, well, it's like, it's like this sort of thing with uh, Isis and Fire and Dionysus and wine, and so forth. So, but as I say, this is a theological claim. The shift from eros to sex, or from Dionysus to wine, depends on acknowledging, but also promoting, naturalizing, if you like, hidden links between phenomena. So metonymy is a way of culturally embedding the idea of the god's stewardship of a particular semantic field. Now, it's actually particularly interesting to think that Greeks thought of this language as figurative. You might have thought that the users of a particular religion wouldn't see the substitution of Dionysus for wine as in any sense rhetorical or stylistic or anything. The effects of drinking might be thought to be the result of Dionysiac influence in quite a literal sense. When Clytophon is at this point at a symposium in honour of the god Dionysus. So if Dionysus has grabbed him, you might say that's actually not a rhetorical uh, weird way of speaking, but this is actually literally what is happening here. The god has possession of him because they're at a festival of Dionysus, and the god can take control of him. But anyway, to separate out the god from the wine, to say that Dionysus simply stands for wine by semantic substitution, as the rhetorical analysis would suggest, might be thought from a religious point of view to be reductive in the extreme. So if we go back to the Catholic example of the Eucharist, it would be a bit like saying that the Eucharistic wafer in Catholicism stands for or substitutes for Jesus' body. And um, I'm no expert here, but I think mainstream Catholicism would probably say, no, transubstantiation is not a, a, a rhetorical or a stylistic thing. Actually, it really is the body of Christ. And similarly, as I say, the effects of Dionysus on your soul um, are not just rhetorical or stylistic wonder. This is supposed to be, I mean, if you in religion, they're supposed to be imagined as literal, real. Now let's take a famous instance from Homer, which dramatizes this question quite starkly. In Book 22, the dying Hector urges his slayer, Achilles, to treat his corpse with respect. Otherwise, he warns, the gods may exact vengeance. Take, or, take thought now, lest perhaps I become a cause of the gods' wrath against you on the day when Paris and Phoebus Apollo slay you, valiant though you are, at the sky and gates. Okay, so the dying Hector is gifted with a kind of premonition of the future, that the day will come when you will be killed by Paris at the sky and gates. Now the interesting thing for my purpose is the two agents of Achilles' prophesied death, Paris and Phoebus Apollo. Apollo, we might assume immediately, indicates not that the god will literally appear and hold the bow with Paris and two of them will simultaneously let loose the arrow. But by metonymy, the accuracy of the bow shot, Apollo is the archer god. Now Paris is normally not very good at archery, although he carries a bow around a lot in the Iliad. Um, in contrast to almost every other archer, he hardly kills anyone. And in fact, actually, he kills only one person in the entire poem of the Iliad. So you might say that for Paris to be able to kill Achilles, the great warrior of the Greek, he's got to have an extra, extra special bit of divine wound at this moment. And that's what Apollo is doing here. Paris and Phoebus Apollo means Paris with a particularly good bow shot. But a moment's thought will tell us that any interpretation in terms of mere metonymy, that's to say just as a rhetorical trick of language, if you like, will not suffice. Hector's warning is that Achilles' impious behavior will lead to the gods' vengeance. And since Apollo is the most prominent supporter of the Trojans, he's the best candidate for vengeance. So Phoebus Apollo doesn't mean just good archery. Phoebus Apollo also means if you act sacrilegiously towards my body, then the gods will come in and they will punish you. Okay, so the god is being invoked as also a religious deity uh, and who is capable of agency and capable of retribution against Achilles for the mistreatment of Hector's corpse. So the question of whether Apollo is real or figurative here 
it starts looking a little bit more complicated. But even so, even though you might think of Apollo's agency as actually really important and substantial in the poem, it is also indirectly opaque. Now, it's got to be, in the first instance, Paris that will kill Achilles. Uh, the scene of Achilles' death doesn't actually appear in Homer, and for what it's worth, we don't have any sources from this early on in the Greek uh, tradition anyway to tell us how, uh, how Achilles died. But the poet is surely not imagining Apollo's literal appearance with Paris. Okay, so how, exactly how we are to imagine the gods' appearance in this scene uh, is a question for us. It's not self-evident. There are other additional complexities to this passage, which I'm not going to go into now, but uh, one of them might be that this isn't actually the narrator's authoritative judgment. This is a character within the text. This is Hector's interpretation of events at a high state, moment, stakes moment. So it's Hector saying, Hector bringing in the idea of Apollo's agency because he is threatening Achilles with retribution if Achilles doesn't treat his corpse well. But as I say, I'll leave aside all of these complexities for now. The central point is that this literary ambivalence about whether we are to read the scene as figurative or literal reflects a theological ambivalence. It really does matter to our reading of the poem whether we think of the involvement of Apollo in Achilles' prospective death as literal or metonymic. But there is no clear way, I think, in the text of conceptualising where divine involvement in human affairs sits on the spectrum between the two. It seems to oscillate. The passage seems to have both models built into it at once. And what we've located here, I think, is a glitch in Greeks' ways of thinking about the divine. On the one hand, they did believe in epiphany, in the physical manifestation of gods in anthropomorphic form in our world. The principle of epiphany raises exactly the kind of problem that we've been considering. How actually are we to imagine the gods appearing in our world? How are we to imagine the interrelationship between gods and ourselves? How are we to imagine Paris and Apollo shooting the arrow simultaneously? But it also raises another kind of question, which is what the gods are doing when they're not appearing in our world? Are they simply withdrawing from it then? Well, Homer has a partial answer for this, because he puts the gods on Olympus, and in particular, Zeus seems to have this all-seeing eye, which allows him to survey the world. So when Zeus is not manifesting himself on the world below, in fact, Zeus never comes down to the world below, um, he is still involving himself remotely. But even that doesn't work entirely, because gods can be distracted. They can, as Zeus does at one point, point fall asleep, um, and terrible things happen while he's obviously seduced by his wife at that point. Um, and this reminds us that Greek the Odyssey, if you like, Greek divine justice, operates aporetically at best. If you can have a model based on the idea of epiphany, then there is a necessary logical consequence of that, that non-epiphany becomes a problem in itself. It becomes a way of thinking about divine inattention, divine absence, divine failure. If epiphany, the manifestation of the gods, is to be a particularly marked form of engagement with um, the, the, between the human and the divine, then it must be significantly better than non-epiphany. And that's where the problem comes in here. Uh, non-epiphany becomes a way of withdrawing God's interest and engagement with our world. So we end up with a model of divinity that is too counterintuitive, if you like. This is maximally counterintuitive because we don't we can't understand precisely how the gods would manifest themselves in our world. Now that's epiphany, okay? The Greeks also imagined gods in a very different way, and perhaps an incompatible way. Um, this is what I call the principle of immanence, immanence, uh, which is the idea that the gods saturate absolutely everything. Every time you shoot a bow, you are doing so with Apollo's help. When you light a fire, that's Hephaestus manifesting himself. Um, in its most extreme form, taken by the pre-Socratic philosophers, for example, there is no literal and physical manifestation of deities at all. You can't have epiphany. That's just a wrong way of looking at the world. Um, that's just anthropomorphic, poetic embellishment. We need to be thinking instead entirely of divine immanence in our world. But the problem with seeing gods as imminent is that by making everything divine, you explain nothing about the divine. Uh, it simply becomes an extension of normal reality. 
There is none of that counterintuitiveness, if you like, that defines religious thought. If every fire is Hephaestus, then Hephaestus becomes a rather vapid concept, becomes a sort of a way of describing what is a part of the normal intuitive world around us. So what I'm arguing is that Greek ideas of the gods slide between the maximally counterintuitive and the um, entirely intuitive, and they have an instability to slide backwards and forwards between the one and the other. Now, another passage that might be read in these terms comes in book one of the Iliad, and, and this is another well known passage, for those of you who are clusters in the room. This is like a tour through the greatest hits of the Iliad. This is the bit where Achilles um, has just his mid argument with Agamemnon, and um, Agamemnon says, um, I'm, uh, if I'm going to have to lose my slave girl, I'm going to take someone else and maybe yours, Achilles. And Achilles is furious, and he's on the point of putting a sword on uh, King Agamemnon at this point. And suddenly, Athena appears to him, and to him alone, pulling his hair, she prevents him from retaliating. So the passage goes, uh, Athena came from heaven sent by the goddess, white-armed the hero, for in her heart she loved them both, that's Achilles and Agamemnon, alike and cared for them. She stood behind him, caught the son of Peleus by his tawny hair, allowing herself to be seen by him alone, and by the rest, no one saw her. Now, the appearance of Athena can be read as a manifestation of Achilles' own thought processes. This was an interpretation advanced by a, uh, an interpreter of Homer in the first century CE, and probably going on uh, earlier uh, interpretation building himself in an earlier interpretation building. You can see there I've underlined the, the crucial bit. The change of heart due to same thinking is very properly identified in the poem with Athena. So basically, Achilles is, has a rush of blood to the head. He thinks, oh, I'm going to kill that bastard. Uh, pulls out, he's just about to pull out his sword. And then he thinks, hmm, no, actually, on second thoughts, you know, put the sword back, relax a little bit, and let's go through. And so that the appearance of Athena. Uh, is not actually a literal epiphany of Athena, it's a metonymic way of thinking of um, the, the idea of the change of heart and the same thinking. <coughs> now, at this point you can see very clearly why what does Athena mean uh, becomes a very salient question. Athena is a word uh, and it is, in fact, actually the form of the word, the very form of the word, that um, discloses its meaning. If we could carry on with the, uh, the explanation, that goddess, Athena, properly, probably owes her name simply to her intelligence, and she is a seer, as the Greek word there, athrena, and she sees through the athrusa. You can see the play on words, the ath bit is being associated with the name of Athena. Um, sees through all things with keen eyes of rational thought. So it's, Athena now is not a goddess, she is a word, and it is, as I say, the very form of the word itself that discloses the meaning of the term. So what does Athena mean? Well, look at the word, look at its relationship with other words, look at this. This is a, a structure of thought that's often called um, etymology, it's not, it hasn't got anything to do with what we call etymology now, because it's not sort of historical linguistics or anything like that. This is, I, needless to say, this is an entirely false in our terms of etymology, but for ancient etymologists, it really matters because it's the way in which you um, make a connection non-arbitrary. If you want to explain a theme on this passage as a manifestation of rational intelligence, you need to have some way of explaining how a concept of theme links up with the concept of rational intelligence, and the etymology is doing that work for it. Now, interestingly, this is, for many scholars, this is actually a plausible reading of the passage. It's not just wacky, late, stoic allegory. It's actually a good reading of the passage, because what is going on here is um, quite clearly a change of thought on Achilles' part. He 